I was born in a town of Postawy. It's a Polish name, means on lakes. It was Poland until 1939. Way back in the history, the Russians, Prussians, and Austro-Hungarian Empire split Poland apart. And a large partition was in 1795. And that part, Poland disappeared, and that part became Russia. As a matter of fact, our town was the uh, summer camp for the Tsar's personal guard. And my father used to be like a little boy, used to fetch the tennis balls from when the Russian officers played tennis without without the uh, fences. So that was that was the background. In 1939, when Hitler and Stalin took Poland apart, we were in the eastern part that became Soviet Union, and we became under the Soviets. Everybody in town, of course, small town, everybody had a business or an angle to do, and they all had to give it up because there was no private enterprise. My father's um, small carbonated drink plant went to the government. My grandfather's fishing business went to the government, and everybody looked for a job in the government. The Russians, when they came in, they didn't have anything. They had trailers hooked up to tractors, and that's how they moved in. And of course, they weren't. There was no technical bill, but, uh, you know, that area, the Jews, the Polish, the Belarusian, the Russians, they all lived side by side. I remember myself learning to speak, and I spoke Yiddish at home, Polish with the kids on the right side, and Russian with the kids on the left side, so <laughs> we all were trilingual. When the, uh, the Soviets came in, my dad hired on to a company. It's like a van torg with like a PX system. And most of the people that were in that town, I mean, with the company, they came in from the east. So as it, as it was, you know, they all lived together and we worked together. And that was pretty much so. Uh, Dad was had different jobs, and uh, I went to a kindergarten. Was learn, learning uh, Russian, of course. And uh, the the company that my dad worked for, the people were kind of friendly. Uh, in the summertime, about every other Sunday or so, they used to go on the picnics. You used to come in, the company trucks come in and parked in front of our house, and we all went for a picnic. Well, June 22nd, 1941, the trucks lined up in front of our house. We're going to go for a picnic. The police department was about a block away from us, and everybody was running. What happened? The Germans have attacked Soviet Union. The picnic was off. My dad was uh, summoned to the uh, selective service business, his identity taken away. He was already like in a draft. My mom says to my dad, what should we do? He says, I don't know. And uh, mom talked to the uh, people that came from the East, worked in the company. She says, uh, what are you guys going to do? We're going back home. Come with us. Well, they thought the war is going to end in a couple of weeks. So, it so happened that another couple, their kids, their boys worked in the same company. They were allotted a horse and buggy, and we were pinned up with this couple. And... Mom got me through the window in the morning so nobody was would know, and we started out and left 
going east because everybody thought that the war is going to end in about two weeks. And the main office of the company was in Politsk, about 250 miles away. So we started out that night in Vorpaeva. It was 30 kilometers from home. Mom did another attempt to get her sister and the family leave. She left me, which was unusual to leave me. She left me through the night, and for about 20 miles one way and 20 miles the other way, she came back for me. She tried to get her sister to get out, and she couldn't. And, and the reason nobody wanted to leave, that they didn't believe that the, uh, that the Germans were so bad, because in 1914 to 1916, the Germans were in town, and they were, um, the trenches were in the backyard of my dad. Matter of fact, my dad's house, the basement, was built by German GIs. And the Germans of those years were different than the young Nazis that came in in 1939. So you couldn't run, you couldn't take a train because Russian Air Force was non-existent. The German Air Force was flying indiscriminately, following the railroad tracks and bombing and strafing the, the, the trains. And so, and we just tried to stay on the, uh, on the main roads because you get off the main road, marauders would think you have something, you know, and try to, rob you or something. I was six years old and uh, and for two weeks Mr. Hirsch Levine says to my mom, what's the matter with the kid? I haven't heard one word from him. I was so depressed, you know. So <clears throat> in the meantime, <clears throat> I didn't know that. Well, nobody knew that. The, uh, the man in charge of the uh, selective service system, when he was walking with the, they were walking with my dad's other people, realized that the Germans were already encircling us and the people weren't, in, weren't trained for military, didn't have any uh, uniforms, nothing. He says, we have decided to let you go home. What about the passports? The identity cards, those are all back in the office, so my dad didn't have an identity card. Well, since we were going towards uh, the main office in Polensk, your dad knew that we were going that way. He was going that way, too. On the way, he found his supervisor holding the company papers. So my dad suggested they burn the papers and lighten up the load and keep on going. And I was sitting in a, uh, in a ditch resting right on this side of the bridge of the River Dvina when I recognized the horse on the highway. There was a bunch of people and highways just rolling. And I ran over and that's my dad saw me. And that's why we were united with my dad. And uh, we went as far as Vitebsk. Uh, I forgot to mention that the two, that other couple who had two teenagers and they were on bicycles. And teenagers were running up and down the highway in the bicycles and we lost them. So we went to Vitebsk and pulled in into a... Uh, yard where two houses were together and the, my dad knew the people, they worked in the same company and, and they were pulling out. And he said to my dad, they explained what uh, they were waiting, looking for the boys. He says, well, we have two houses. We can move in and stay as long as you want. So we waited two, two days or three days, I don't remember. And uh, in the morning, Mr. Levin comes back and says, the Germans are on the other side of the town, and we better start running. So we jumped in the 
the wagon started pulling out. When the tanks went through, they, they uh, uprooted the road. The, the cobblestone, everything was just messed up. The road was just bad. The uh, militiamen were standing there with cocktails and didn't want to talk to anybody because they knew they were going to die. They were waiting for the tanks to come in. And while we were waiting for the for the place for about three days, we missed the time, and, and we were right in front of the Germans. And so those days we were making like 50 kilometers a day trying to escape. And towards the end of the day, we helped the help the man helped the the horse pull the the carriage and. In the morning, it was also fresh. And that went on for a long time until, uh, well, we were in Vitebsk, Smolensk, in Smolensk. The uh, Russian Air Force took down two, the, uh, two uh, German planes, and afterward, the German came in and they strafed and bombed everybody. We were trying to to come in. In Yartseva we saw where people came out of uh, encirclement and they were just happy. The Russian GIs were just happy to come out of encirclement. And uh, as usually, the Russian GIs fed us and also showed us how to hide from the German planes because the planes would come in on a nice day and try to shoot at you. And we would we would uh, lay on one side of the road, and when, if he could shoot you in the back, he would. But then he would come around to try to shoot you in the back. While he was making the circles, we and the GIs were running to the other side, so he wouldn't have a good target, you know. And this went on at at one point. It was on the other side of Yarseva. We were going through a place where the road was cut in through a hill and then there's there's a depression. When it's cut in through a hill there was no culvert, it was just plain. And that plane caught us right there where we were and I felt my mother fell on fell on top of me to protect me and I was watching the dirt, just bullets hitting the dirt. When he the plane came out the next place was a bridge, and the center was on the plate, and he just took one rifle and shot and shut it down, and it went down on the farm field, and the farmers just killed the pilot with pitchforks, you know. So we, uh, we traveled like that all the way to the city of Kaluga, and at that time, the, the authorities wouldn't let us uh, travel anymore by horse and buggy. They, uh, we surrendered the horse and buggy to a, uh, uh, a veteran's office. They gave us cookies and stuff and put us on the train. And they said, well, this plane goes to Siberia and this plane goes southeast. It's Central Asia. It's warm over there. Mom says, we don't have any clothes. Well, take that plane. So that's how we ended up in Uzbekistan. Uh, every time that it was, it was freight trains, you couldn't tell which train is going. There was no schedule. It was at one point, we were always somebody was with me, either mom or my dad. Mom went to get some hot water to make something and the train left. And mom says to somebody stand by, says, Is that train had horses? Yep. Oh. So we lost because every time we'd come in, people just were le left uh, on, the, on the station because they couldn't make it back. And the train went off. There was no schedule. And the trains lined up like seven, ten trains on the tracks and didn't know it. Didn't know it. So uh, Dad and I were with me in tow looking at the uh, find my mother 
as luck had it, she was on the same train in a different wagon, you know. But after that, they, they were trying to get my dad find out why he is traveling with us at draft age. So at one point, some officer wrote a note saying, let Mr. Katz settle up his family and he'll report to the uh, selective service at the time. And that's how we got in Central Asia. As it turned out at the time, the Russian authorities did not want to draft former Polish citizens because they wanted to, they were thinking about creating a Polish division under General Anderson. So that's how we stayed. And uh, we lived in Uzbekistan in a uh, valley, in the, in the Fergana Valley in the Tanzan Mountains, and we all got sick of malaria. And uh, I was almost gone. I was on the floor when they gave me, was supposed to give me three shots. After they gave me the second shot, I was able to move and I ran away. And would you believe I felt nuts on my buttocks until about 15 years ago from the places they gave me those shots. We lived with the Uzbeks. It was about two weeks after we got there. We lived in the in the village, and uh, I learned Uzbek quick and start translating to my parents. You know, and the the, the natives thought I was one of them because I got suntanned and went looked like an Uzbek. And we lived there for for four years. And one day we got. When we knew that, uh, my parents knew that the town was liberated, they wrote to this city office, and the city mayor gave the letter to one of our neighbors, and she sent back a letter, said, and that's when we found out that everybody was killed. So, in 1945, we came back to this town of Pastava because one of the of my cousins that survived in in the uh, resistance he sent us a uh, a request for us to travel and we came back to Pastava all of my uh, people my same same age were already going to third and fourth grade and I never went to school because there was no school for me in Uzbekistan. The Uzbeks didn't send their kids to school. So I started school way back. Instead of first grade, I crashed into second grade, tried to make up, and it took me a long time to get A's and B's, a couple of years. And, um, of course, we lived in Russia. Dad worked and mother worked. and. Uh, Things weren't that bad. I mean, it was, it was our country, you know. And then I went to school in, uh, in, in the Automotive Institute in, in Moscow. And I studied there. It was When we came in for our third year studies, the Dean of Mechanical Engineering said, your third year is selected to go to work in a uh, Virgin Lens. Mm -hmm. Virgin Lens, what's the Virgin Lens? Well, it's a big harvest, we need people. So it, third year Mechanical Engineering was about 280 students. And they put us all on a freight train and we traveled in Siberia for seven days. And we had to stay on the side track because the Moscow Vladivostok Express was coming through. We had to let them through, you know. It took us seven days to get there. And we ended up in a village which wasn't any virgin lands. The village was about 120 years old. And most of the people over there were people from the... Uh, western part of Russia that were settlers there. And we just worked in the fields. 
dug up potatoes or uh, trying to cool down the wheat they they uh, had on a big pile and just plain work. It took us another seven days to get to Moscow. And then my dad finally got permission to uh, repatriate from Russia to Poland after the Hungarian Revolution. Something similar was brewing in Poland, and to ease tensions between the countries, they have decided to let people that claim to be Poland or live under Polish rule to travel to Poland. And we knew that some Poles were coming in over there and telling that from Poland you can leave to go in the West. and. Uh, so we signed up and we uh, ended up in the city of Częstochowa, which is the the center of the Black Madonna of Częstochowa, a re very religious town. And from there, we made our way to the United States. The uh, war years in Russia was that a kid was allowed 50 grams of bread. It was rations, you know, it was hunger. Everybody was dying. There was a lot of people, refugees that came from Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, all those people. They ended up living over there. Older people, youngsters, the young men were drafted. Uh, people we knew were 16 years old. They were drafted into the service. They were from the... Uh, eastern part of Russia, you know, from Kiev, from Belarus. Um, you had to get acclimated with those people, you know. You had to learn how to live. Um, to a lot of people, to a lot of locals, we were strangers, but they were very nice to us. We were, they were calling us guests, and I can't say how nice the Uzbeks were to people that arrived there. Everybody was under stress war. The Uzbeks did not want to go into army. A lot of them were deserters and to them Russia was strange. They didn't feel like they wanted to fight or leave their families. A lot of them were, hide, were hiding. Matter of fact, my best friend dad was hiding and, and I knew where he was and you know he was a Uzbek. We were friends over there. Right away, we uh, we started the gardens and planted tomatoes and corn, all kind of stuff. And the water was in big demand. The water company was always watching that the water in the creeks where nobody would steal. And and whenever he went by, I would I would make another hole so the water would run into our tomatoes, you know. <laughs> My good best friend says, I said, I'm Jewish. He said, Jewish? He said, what's that? You know? <laughs> but there was a lot of Jews there and a lot of Russians, uh, not Jews. There was a lot of us over there that came in uh, during the Second World War. And... Uh, some people lived there, you know, in peacetime too, but uh, that wasn't uh, that wasn't the repression. The repression of Jews was when uh, you wanted to get a job or you wanted to go to college. The, the days that I was looking for a college, there was nobody could apply in college in Minsk, Belarus. It was Jewish, because. Unwritten rule was you couldn't go there. Most of us went to uh, Lithuania, which Lithuania was about 12 miles from us. You know, in Lithuania you could uh, you could apply as a Jew, no problem. Uh, the religion wasn't that uh, number one thing. Survival and making making dinner. My dad used to get up at four o'clock in the morning go to the uh, small creeks and catch a pound of fish, you know, for dinner before he went to work. Uh, 
he was like a bookkeeper and he was assigned to do inventories and in small kiosks and stuff like that all through the uh, valley. So whenever he went through doing the uh, an inventory, everything had to be just so. And the guy says, no problem, just make sure. And you come back, you're going to have a, loaf, a half a loaf of bread, <laughs> that kind. But uh, as a kid growing up, you know, uh, we used to, the plant was my uh, grandfather's property. He had an ice house and a fish processing place in front of it. And my dad had his equipment, <coughs> excuse me, where they used to bottle carbonated drinks. They would put a little bit of syrup and then uh, club soda like in it and they uh, cork it up and then we took it to, he took it to uh, small bars. He also had a, a license for one line of beer from uh, Riga, Latvia. But most of the time in the summertime he used to take a uh, carload of uh, carbonated drinks to festivals and sold it off the right of the wagon. And it just made a living. It, it just, some, everybody made some kind of living. Actually, they started the, uh, the plant in another town because my grandfather financed the competition and we were out of town. <laughs> it had to be in another town, <laughs> you know. Being Jewish, You know, they they tell you like this. They say, oh, those damn Jews, not you, but, you know, those Jews. That kind of stuff. <laughs> not you, you're okay. But then, then problems came like, I don't know if you people know about it. There was a crisis in the Kremlin where they accused the doctors trying to poison Stalin at the yeah. time. You know, the doctor's problem. That was bad for everybody. All the Jews were, you know, all your Jews were bad, you know, that kind of stuff. As it turned out, later on, they found out it was it was really nothing, and it was all made up, you know. So, um, at one time in the in the forties, uh, we were always thought that something may happen. We may be uh, uh, taken out because they were coming and they were doing the um, collectivization because the Soviet Union came to our area in 1939. A couple of years later, war started and it was, went up to 1945 and the farmers worked for themselves, but then they started to collectivize them. And, and that's when things went bad. On a given Sunday, people from Moscow, Leningrad, Kiev, Kharkov, all those places came in to buy cattle for meat. And my dad worked as an expediter for Wine Torg. He knew what was going on. And on a given day, a thousand head of cattle was sold, okay, and they, they hold it away. In 1948, when the collectivization started, all the farmers got collectivized, you could find about 25 heads of cattle, all milk cows, that's all there was. That's all there was to buy, nothing. And then 1957, Khrushchev came to the United States and they took him to Iowa and showed him how to raise uh, Angus and, and he says, uh, how do you do it? He says, in Iowa, he says, well, we'll feed him corn. He came back and he told all the collective farms to plow up the hay fields and raise corn. Okay, right before that, before the the collective farms came in into being, 
People plowed with a horse, you know, and small plowed. But they came in with big tractors, and they came in, the uh, hay fields are usually places close to bogs and stuff like that, because you couldn't plant anything, you raised hay. And they plowed it up, the red sand on top and black top on the bottom. When they planted corn, nothing came up. And the following winter, all the cows in the barns froze because they could not, they didn't have the hay because there was no hay fields anymore. They used, uh, uh, to the countryside in Russia, the, uh, in the villages, the, uh, the roofs are made out of straw, wheat straw. So they pulled the old straw, this 10-year-old, 20-year-old straw out of the roofs and put it in hot scalding water, tried to mix it up to give it to the cows. And they didn't have anything to chew on. And the, the people just couldn't understand. It was criminal the way they did that. So there was nothing. In our town, you couldn't, you couldn't find a milk place, a milk store. You couldn't buy milk. We had cows, one or two cows at the time, and in the summertime, you take it to the end of the street, and they were, there was a pasture there, and we sold the milk to, to our neighbors. That's how they bought milk. You know, the town was, at, at the time, the town was, I would say, about 20,000 people. Now it's about 40. But uh, there was not a milk store. You couldn't buy it. You know, of course, Talking about salad, when I came to Poland, they offered a salad. I said, oh, a salad? What salad? You know, we never ate salad. You know, the only thing we had in the wintertime was uh, uh, pickles, uh, sauerkraut, and that kind of stuff, you know, in, in the cellar. We did not have, we didn't know anything about salad or any, any fresh fruits in the wintertime, nobody. You know, the, it's funny, when I was in Moscow, I was walking down and there was a grocery store and they had uh, outside in the boxes, they said those are bananas and they were black. They were so old, it was black. And then the first banana, first banana I tried, it was, it was the skin was black, I didn't know what. A banana was, you know. Well, let me let me go back. In 1939, or right before that, I had an older brother who was born with a uh, spinal cord damage, and he was bedridden. The United States wouldn't let us in. We had papers. My dad had papers, and my brother passed away in 1938. And my dad was supposed to go in 1939 to Warsaw, Poland. Yeah, we, we were Poland at the time to finish up the paper. His brother, Dave Katz, in DeKalb, Illinois, has $75,000 bond signed that we will not become a ward of the state, you know, because of that. But that's, see, my dad had a brother and about 50 cousins in America. My mom was the youngest one in her family. She had a brother in Dayton and another brother in Dayton, then he moved to Indianapolis, and a sister in Akron, Ohio. My grandparents, my mom's father and mother, came to America in 1928 to visit the kids and the grandchildren. And they lived in Dayton, and my grandfather had something to do, so they used to take him to Franklin, Ohio. He had a, a room there and a horse and wagon, and he used to come around and uh, collect papers and rags and stuff like that. At Friday, they'd take them back to Dayton. So he said to my grandma, he says, you know what, I like it. I could, I, we could make a living, but you have to come to Franklin to, to make house. She says, I'm not going. We're going back. They packed up, came back to Poland. 
And over there in Poland and in Russia, you know, if you own property, just one half of the street, you have to, it's your responsibility to keep it clean. So she got heated up and she was doing ice or something. She got pneumonia and she passed away. So, but, uh, you know, over there in a the small town, there was a small synagogue and, and uh, my grandfather was somebody. I mean, an elder. Here in Dayton, he was a nobody, so he, he didn't feel like he was losing. Beside that, they had, uh, see, about nine, about ten grandchildren over there. And they were bonded with them. And these kids, you know, they spoke English and they didn't speak English, so they, they wanted to go back. And they went, went back. And then my grandfather passed away. Uh, he was uh, like uh, on Hanukkah in 1939. And so, you know, living there and, and, and knowing what you are and so on, I was accepted everywhere. I didn't feel like I was really discriminated. I was playing soccer for the high school and automatically for the town and the county. county. We were, I mean, there was nobody else who could take our place for the city or the county. Our high school team and a few guys from town, we were the soccer team. And uh, there were five different uh, military outfits around town and they wanted to play, get out of the barracks. So they rang the phone off the hooks and let's play on Sunday. So we would pick some outfit on Sunday afternoon. Downtown they put a big sign that says soccer 530. So we played soccer with this. And they, they would get passes to get out and get loaded with vodka. <laughs> and we would play with them. We liked to play. They were older than us. We were, you know, 16, 17 year olds and would run circles around them. But uh, the team was was, was good. Uh, when I left, my our team. When I went to college, our team was uh, took the uh, uh, cup for the for the uh, Belarusian Republic three times, three years in a row, and they retired it. You know, during the Second World War. Yeah, my my mother had a. Uh, had an older sister that she looked up to. Norman was the oldest son, Norman Fishman. Norman didn't stay because when we were talking about going east, Norman says, go, I'm right behind you. But he only went to next town, was 60 kilometers away where Libby was. They were already, you know, a couple. So he never, he never was under occupation there, but the whole family later on went and resisted. That's how he survived. But he had three brothers and a sister, their parents, and they lived in a complex that used to be my grandfather's place. Down below, there was my mother's younger brother. He passed away. He had a widow with four girls. And I have the pictures. I will found the pictures here. They all passed away. Then my uh, my brother, my dad's brother, was put in jail for about six months on a on a nothing, and he died in 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 uh, Grodno in jail during the occupation. He was killed there, and his wife and daughter were killed there. My grandfather was 83 years old. He couldn't walk and they killed him right in the ghetto when they were driving everybody to the uh, hole outside. You know, it, that was our closest family, so it's 14 pe people. You know, it was a, you know, I was a child and to me it was, wasn't as bad, but when the news came in, when we were in Uzbekistan, my parents were just flattened. They just couldn't leave it over. We didn't have anybody left there, you know. 
<clears throat> everybody wanted to get out of Russia. See, coming out of Russia to Poland, the Jews were able to get out because only those that had Polish citizenship before 1939. Even the Poles that lived in the country, if they didn't have any documents and proved, the, the authorities would say, you're not Polish, you're Catholic, but you're Belarus, you know. And people not educated and not have any means to fight them couldn't get out. But the Jews that lived there automatically had Polish citizenship. So we were, we were applied. It took my dad eight, eight, eight sets of papers t to get permission to get out. You know, he used to make carbon copies of his papers and take them in and then, you know. And everybody says, Cats, why are you leaving? You, you got a house, you got everything, it's so good. He says, it's, why are you leaving? You know, it's it's a saying in, in, in Russia, it's a saying, Tam Dabra Dunasnima means it's good places but where where we are not. He says, Well I wanna go where you're not, you know. Yeah. So it you know, I think our family lived there probably from uh Seventeen hundreds. So the city itself was was first on the book since fourteen oh nine. You know that was a Polish place, but our family was invited into Poland, and and Polish kings were used to invite. They invited because. Unlike other people that were tailors, shoemakers, or so on, or Luftmansen, our family was fisher, fishermen. They used to write contracts with big landowners to fish their lakes, and that was their business, you know. And over there in, in that part of the country, the Poland, the Jews and the, and the Catholics had to have fish on Friday, and that's... You you could you just fish it and deliver it fresh. Uh, you had ice and so on. In the winter time, they, if they have a good catch, they box it up, put it on a train, go about fifty miles to Vilna, the capital of Lithuania. You know, yeah. But uh, as me as a person myself, I don't say that. I had uh, discrimination, I did have discrimination, because when we graduated from high school, everybody was offered to go to a military officer's training academy. I was offered to go to non-commissioned officer's training. I said, I said, thank you, I'm going to college anyway. It because they knew that we had relatives in America, and that and they had pictures of my relatives in America in KBG. Before we got it, they took pictures. See, my Uncle Dave, my dad's brother, had portraits of he and his wife and three boys. Nice pictures, you know. And when we ran away, of course, we didn't take anything. So after the war, and Dad wrote to his brother, he says, you know, I don't have any pictures of you. Would you send me pictures? Well, a friend of ours during the, uh, during the uh, doctor's crisis was called in to KBG, and she, said, and she was shown the pictures. He says, do you recognize anybody? He says, well, this guy looks like Larry. Oh, really? <laughs> it was my cousin. <laughs> yeah. You know, in that environment, there was, that's what you, that's where you lived, and I, I didn't think so. You know, my parents probably recognized when, when I was flat on the floor, couldn't get up, but only child is dying, you know. My mother, my, my mother got sick, and I think it was typhoid or something, they took her to a, six kilometer away 
and uh, there was no transportation. When she and she spent there probably six weeks, and she, she came back, she was shorn and she couldn't walk. One one of her legs somehow got some nervous condition; she wouldn't walk. The dad brought her back in the wagon. So we, we talked to the doctor. What are you going to do? She says, "Well." Uh, one thing I would do is try electric lamps, you know. Well, we didn't have electricity. So, Dad said, well, let's see. We had this use bag bed. It was just a flat, big, wooden thing. So we pushed it against the window and put a blanket over the window. And she stuck out her leg outside to get the sun beating on it. That's the best thing, you know. And it took about three or four months for her to get to a point where she could walk again. Uh, the quinine was so bitter that, that this kid just refused to take it. My dad had to go to work. He was sick of malaria, and uh, he had to take it. Well. When we came back, he was stone deaf because quinine killed his nerve, his hearing nerve. We went to Dr. Soifer here in town. He says, I can do anything for you, you know. He used to carry a big uh, hearing aid and his problems. He couldn't learn the language too well, you know, and so on. So there was problems with that. Um, in the spring of 58, I was supposed to have final exams of my third year of mechanical engineering. As you know, we had to leave the country one month before. I tried to make arrangements to take the test. It says, listen, you want to leave? Leave now or you're never going to leave, you know. So I came out. I had just transcript for two and a half years in mechanical engineering. Well, when I went to Illinois, the guy says, uh, my uncle owned Chevy Olds and Cadillac in DeKalb, Chevy Olds, Chevy and Olds in Sycamore, six miles away. Each son had a, had a dealership. So, Larry, you're going to start learning business from the back. So, I started the paint shop and the body shop. And lo and behold, I had to register for draft because when I was in Poland, I had to sign it that uh, within six months upon arrival in the United States, I will go to a selective service board and register there. So I waited five and a half months. See, I, I didn't go to Russian military because in college I was a ROTC over there and I didn't go. So here I said, well, <coughs> I got to go to service, you know. So they took me into Chicago for a uh, physical, and half of the guys were uh, got syphilis or something, you know, and they didn't, didn't call them. <laughs> you go, you go through the doorway, and the, and the uh, the doctor will put the stethoscope. Okay, keep on moving. They didn't know. <laughs> Half of the people flocked to English. Here I am, six months in America. I passed the test, <laughs> dummy. So I come home, and my uh, uncle's buddy was on a selective service board in Sycamore, Illinois. He says, they're going to take the kid. And the reason why they're going to take him is because they are supposed to supply so many heads a month or a year. And they can always take the 18-year-olds, but the 25-year-olds, if they don't take them now, they're never going to take them. So he's going. I said, well, I guess they're going to go to service. So the guy's uh, in the shop with me. He says, you know, why don't you walk across the street? There's a, uh, a, a reserve unit over there. Maybe you can sign up for six months and go. So I went in there. The guy would... He wanted me to sign up for four years, and finally got him convinced that I don't want to. So I went in for six months. Sure enough, 
They called me and I went in uh, yeah, 1961 and, and I think in, in Ju July or August went into basic training at Fort Leonard, Missouri. And uh, they, uh, as it, instead of six months, we only served five and a half because they wanted to clear the whole fort of people for Christmas. So it was Operation Christmas. Now, and I wasn't there. It was Fort Leonard, Missouri, uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Our next station was that they wanted to close the uh, the whole place, and so they let us in in, in five and a half months, but it counted as six. I came, when I came back from my service, I didn't want to go to, to DeKalb. I came to Dayton where my parents were. And I went to find a unit over here, and I served with them until it was disbanded, and I was in the control group. But uh, I, um, I was discharged, honorably discharged, as a uh, staff sergeant in, in artillery. You know. it, was, it was a good experience. The sergeant says to me, you speak better English than the Texans do, you know. <laughs> It's, uh, we married in 68, so it makes it, what, uh, 54 years now. Yeah. And uh, Hank DeLott and I went to visit my aunt at the Good Samaritan Hospital. She had a stroke and she was in the hospital. So Hank says, let's go to Goody Goody's, have a cup of coffee. So we're sitting there. And uh, another couple sits across to us, and the lady says to him, Hey, who is that young man? And he says, That's my cousin Larry. Oh, I said, What's your name? Rosenthal. Oh, wait a minute. I think I called your house, and your daughter didn't want to come to the phone. <laughs> so she says, Would you please call again? <laughs> Would you please? 